How are we doing, fellas? It's another episode of the MLS Aces podcast. Uh, that was some real sensual music to really, no, to really I, get I really got into that music. <laughs> that was, um, that was, that was a, great. This is a new, a new full time gang we got here, producing Vonders. That's what we're going to go with. That's what you created. Our um, MLS Aces pool goalkeeper, our MLS Aces Il Senio, whatever else you want to call him, Vaughn. Welcome to the full time gang of, of MLS Aces. I know. I'm, I'm the TAM level signing, joining the three <laughs> DPs. So this is, we, I, I know my place. I know my place. Oh, yeah. That's what really Jason's, like, all the DPs whoa. whoa! Jason's more of a supplemental roster kind of guy. That's, what that's, that's in the world? Honest. I'm the James Sands of this podcast. Oh, so you're, you're I still don't know if he knows who that is. Now he can't talk shit about me. <laughs> I can't. You know, I really can't. Um, Jason, you are also here. How are you, bud? Well, I mean, less good now. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, we're good. We're good. We're doing okay. well. I, I'm, I like the DP level, but you're okay. not. You're not. It's fine. Uh, you're homegrown for sure. But Sam, you are definitely a DP level signing. The- How are you, bud? Yeah, uh, I'm doing fantastic. Yeah, because you know, there's always that one DP goalie. You know, Tim Howard. Yeah, <laughs> that's you. <laughs> I'll take that hey. one. So. He had good. one good PK save in the playoffs against the Galaxy that one year. I remember. Yeah, it was that. against Ashley Cole. It was a really good save. I thought oh, it was against Ashley Cole. Remember when Ashley Cole was in Major League Soccer? Damn. Yeah, he was there for too long. That's, uh, <laughs> nah, he wasn't. He was actually oh, not too well, bad though. compared to the rest of the no, those LA Galaxy squads. He, he wasn't. He wasn't good either. I am, yeah, but the rest of them. on the shitty squad, he was the good of the shit. There you go. We'll okay. Take that. I'll okay. Take that. So if I didn't say this before, this is episode 177 of the MLS Aces podcast. Glad if you guys uh, catch us watching it live, if you're watching it later on on YouTube or Twitch, or if you're listening to the podcast, because that's what the name of this is. Uh, Sam, did you get a haircut? Uh, no, I just pulled it back into a man bun. Uh, it's, um, okay. It's All 77 right. degrees let's get a side outside. View. Side view. Uh, it- oh, that looks good. You, I can't good. even. I can't hear if you see it. Can you see that? No. Yeah, no, that was good. That was good. <laughs> was that that was, nice. Yeah, I like it. I got really distracted, so sorry about that. Today has uh, been hey. a day. I'm excited to talk, though. So, episode 177 of the podcast is brought to you guys by Added Time Outfitters. If you guys didn't know, Added Time Outfitters brings you guys some soccer-inspired wristbands that are sick as hell. Um, If you guys want to remember the Columbus crew winning the 2020 MLS Cup, if you guys want to remember the U.S. Women's National Team winning a a, a World Cup, if you guys want to remember anything within U.S. soccer, within European soccer, Barcelona, Celtic, they have wristbands inspired by your favorite teams and your favorite moments. So head over to edittimeoutfitters.com, use promo code MLSACES, and get 20% off towards your order. Again, promo code MLSACES, 20% off. Go over there, check it out, get yourself a wristband. Thank you to Edit Time for sponsoring this episode as well. We got Tom, we got Jason, we got Vaughn, we got Sam. We are talking a lot of U.S. soccer today because there was a lot of news since last time. Last episode, if you guys haven't checked it out, we recorded with the Soccer Cooligans. Christian, Alexis, thank you guys for coming on again. So really wasn't a lot of time to uh, dive super in de- like depth with some things, but we were able to just chat with two of the coolest dudes in soccer. So that's always a plus. But let's dive into U.S. soccer. Let's do what we do best. Let's talk. Let's bring up some random shit and go down a wormhole that uh, we probably shouldn't be going down. <laughs> so... Last time True. we did mention with the Cooligans that Thierry Henry did step down from uh, Club de Foot Montreal. Uh, Thierry Henry's time in Montreal may be cut a little short, in my opinion. I liked what he was doing. Sam, you and uh, Christian, you guys agreed that maybe he wasn't doing some things too positive. But we do have a replacement now. Uh, CF Montreal, they announced that they hired a brand new um, head coach in Wilfred Nancy, who is a longtime assistant uh, coach there within the organization, going back from you know 2016 with the impact all the way now, I guess, to the rebrand of uh, Club de Foot Montreal. So, pretty much what I want to dive into is I'm a fan of this move. I always like internal hirings. I always like a guy who's been working his ass off, getting a shot at you know the ultimate goal of being a head coach in professional soccer. But Sam, I saw you have a take on this on Twitter, so I'm going to go to you first. Uh, we'll I'll take Nancy. on Twitter. Oh shit! I don't remember my. I Twitter could be time. wrong. Maybe maybe it was someone else. But I'll, I'll go to you I first. Have, so 
we're all in quick quick take hot takes, right? Uh, I, I like this. I mean, I think it's a good move. The guy's been there since 2016, I think it is. So he's, he's been with the club for years. He's gone through Thierry Henry. He went through Wilmer Cabrera. Um, Remy Gard was there, if uh, we all remember. And, and so like he's seen a number of different styles of play. Wait. He's seen Montreal. You forgot a manager. Can you name me that last manager? The most recent one? No, you named Henri, you named Cabrera, you named Remy Gard. You forgot one manager he was an assistant under. Remy Gard, I do not remember that. See, I, I can <laughs> look his Wikipedia is in front of me. Uh, Mauro Biello. Biello. Yeah. Yeah. Well, come on, man. Legends. Sorry. Continue. Go right ahead. Uh, you're right. And um, so he, he, I think he's seen it all. He's been there. Um, he understands the way the club is trying to move forward. I, I mean, honestly, like you said, an internal hiring of a guy who knows – what the club wants is good for the club. Will it be good for the fan base? I'm not sure because are they going to be really great on the field? I don't know. I don't know what his style of play is going to be like. I don't know what he plans on doing for signings and what preseason is going to look like and things like that. But it's an exciting time in Montreal. I'll say that. That's that's very fair. Rebrand, brand new head coach. Let's see where things go. Uh, producing. How are you? How, uh, how How's your take on Wilfred Nancy? Uh, I mean, low-hanging fruit. I'm happy that there's still a Wilfred in the league with Zahibo <laughs> gone. Um, and, but, I mean, do, do, do I have, like, big thoughts on Wilfred Nancy? No. Uh, I, I do uh, like that uh, it's a minority hire, right? There, there's mm. uh, not enough black coaches in the league uh, or in uh, high front office positions. I know that's a very hot topic right now. Uh, so kudos to uh, the front office at, at Club to Foot of making that move and making it swiftly. Uh, I, I think this is a perfect example of a longtime assistant uh, that has uh, put in the time and is getting the promotion from within the club. So that is a step in the right direction uh, for at least one club in the league. Uh, so that is a good metric uh, as much as, I, I don't know what he's going to do for Montreal, right? Like, I don't know how this club's getting better. Uh, it's definitely a challenging situation, right? Like, he's stepping in right ahead of preseason. Um, he, he's he's having to make that jump. He hasn't been quite in this role. Um, there's a lot of transition on that roster. Uh, so is it an exciting time for Montreal? Yeah. Is this a team that's going to be competing for MLS Cup? No, I, I don't think so. Um, not Not this year. Uh, but hopefully they can carry some of that momentum that they had making the playoffs, uh, getting that energized fan base uh, after Henri, uh, and, and also now maybe getting back into stadiums. So with all those things, yeah, fantastic. Uh, looking forward to seeing what, what Wilfried Nazi can do. Jason, now shit all over that and tell us why Club de Foot Montreal is MLS, MLS Cup contender, please. Uh, they aren't because Columbus exists. Um, but... There's only My, one team in the way. Is that all you're telling me? <laughs> They're the yeah. only team standing between Montreal and a cup. Exactly. <laughs> no, I for for this move though, like I I actually really like it, and I have two like main reasons why. And one is that he's technically actually been there since 2011 when the club was created. Uh, he wasn't with like the first team coaching or assisting since 2016, but he also was at the U16 level, U18 level, and U21 level prior to that. Um, so, I mean, this guy's been around the club for 10 years. He knows all the ins and outs. Like, obviously, they didn't have a lot of time to make like their their dream hire or their choice because Henri left, and it was like, oh, no shit, everyone else is hired a coach by then. Um, <clears throat> but all things considered, like, I think it's a good move. The second reason is that he went to the sporting director, uh, and was like, Hey, it's my turn. Essentially. Like he wanted this and he's getting a shot at it. So he's invested in way more ways than like just hiring s some other guy, you know? So I think like the investment at least is there in him and he's been there a long time where that transition, it can be, well, pretty much seamless. I mean, that, that's a fair point, Jason, right? Like he kind of owned it, right? Like he wanted to walk up, he walked up there and he was like, I've been here forever. I've yeah. been under now four different managers, four different managers. I mean, 
Wilmer Cabrera was on an interim basis, so maybe, you know, not really counting him, but three, four different managers that wanted to keep me on as an assistant. I've been here from the beginning. I know these halls. I know everything, like, probably better than any new manager that's going to come in, so why not give me the shot? And, I mean, the guy deserves it. Kind of let let him sink or swim now, and, you know, I hope he he swims, and let's go. I mean, uh, Wilfred Nancy, welcome to the uh, MLS coaching ranks because – you deserve it now. Go out there. Um, build upon your one Canadian championship. Go win another. Go win an MLS Cup. Go win whatever you can win. And uh, let's hope for, for your future success, Wilfred. Um, cool. Speaking of Canadian soccer teams, speaking of Canadian championships, we have some news regarding the 2020 version of the Canadian championship. Obviously, due to COVID, some things were a little different last year. Um, Pretty much, it was going to be the MLS Canada team winner versus the uh, Canadian Premier League team winner, and they were going to go at it in a Canadian championship final. Um, The winner of that final obviously goes to the 2021 version of CONCACAF Champions League. Well, Due to some positive cases of COVID within Forge FC of the Canadian Premier League, um, that game is no longer, well, it's going to be postponed indefinitely. There's a date to be uh, DVD, but um, we don't know when that's going to happen. But Canada Soccer, Forge FC, Toronto FC all agree that Toronto is going to represent Canada in uh, the 2021 version of the CONCACAF Champions League. Jason, Sam, you guys said you didn't really have much to add about this, but... Vaughn, I don't know if you do. You didn't say anything, so I'm going to go to you anyway. But it kind of sucks for Forge FC, in my opinion. Like, not that I think Forge actually would have won this game. You know, the CPL, their rosters and everything like that is still being determined right now with MLS rosters. But it just didn't seem like it was any type of shot for Forge to actually come out as a winner of this game. And that Toronto was going to be um, representing Canada in, in CCL. But just kind of more solidifies the fact of kind of what we know. This game is going to happen at some point. I hope it does happen. And I hope that um, since it's going to be hosted at Forge's home grounds, that I hope it's just going to be a game for the fans to come out. Maybe some money's thrown Forge FC's way and, you know, CPL can grow too. So if you guys have anything you want to say there, go for it. But that's pretty much uh, the Canadian Championship update that definitely wanted to go through. Next update. This did happen last week, too. Didn't get a touch on it. But Raymond Gaddis, Ray Gaddis, uh, now former Philadelphia Union player, has decided to retire after nine full seasons with the Philadelphia Union. Um, an absolute legend of Major League Soccer, and more specifically, like I said, of the Philadelphia Union. If you want to talk about consistency and, and a constant you know, player that you can just mark into the 11 every single week. That was Raymond Gaddis for the Philadelphia Union. Like I said, nine seasons for the club. Um, off the field, an absolute, you know, force in kind of being connected to the community, working hard for the community. In 2020, he was one of the faces and one of the leaders of the, the Black Players Coalition. And, you know, not always got the credit where he deserved on and off the field, I feel, but I want to give him that credit now. Um, guys, Jason, Sam, Vaughn, Jason, I'll go to you first. Ray Gaddis, I guess, kind of, what are you going to remember about, about Gaddis, uh, running up that right side of the field for the union? I mean, the guy, like you said, was just like automatic in the start, right? Like I looked at his stats, 221 games played and he started 211. So he basically was just like, mark him down in Sharpie and then figure out the rest of the team which is a, like a trait that really like, over, after 18,000 minutes played, like that's pretty insane how much and how consistent he actually was. And just from the very beginning, only n- like not starting 10 games. And I think one of those was like a season where he was hurt for part of it is pretty wild. Um, so, I mean, f- from that perspective, it's just like this guy was so consistent in someone that I bet like almost every team would have, would want like a guy that they can just slot in and just forget about it because it's always going to work, always going to be consistent. Uh, Whoever wants to take it next, Samuel, (laughs) go for it. I'll I'll hop in. Yeah. No, pretty much Jason hit the nail on the head. You Sharpie Ray Gaddis in and and you just know you're going to have a solid player. I mean, yeah, 34 for 34 games played, 34 games started in 2019. 15 games played, 15 started in 2020, and like just so on and so forth. He he's the leader in minutes in Philly all time. 
um, as a, and that was in 2018. He got that, but like he, he was just consistent and it, it, it's tough to lose a guy like that in your locker room that you've had literally since 2012 as a starter. So that's, that's going to be a tough one for, um, for Philly, but I mean, good for him. What a career. It, it also feels kind of uncommon that there's a guy who just had his whole career with one team, like yeah. in our current, in our current like era of MLS just seems not super. Like when I looked at it, I was like, Oh wow. Like I didn't realize it's just the consistency and just only union. Yeah, I mean, well, there's that, a lot that, of teams like that. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Is I, I don't think there's going to be a lot of players that are these one-team mm-hmm. uh, anchors anymore. Like, with the expanded free agency that's coming on, uh, with the changes with the U22 rule, uh, with, with the league trying to go younger, you know, I don't think we're going to see a lot of teams, uh, you know, they're trying to be a selling league. So I don't think there's going to be a lot of these homegrowns that, that come in and uh, go through the entire process, through their entire career with one team. I could be wrong on that, uh, but I, th- I think it's going to become more and more rare, right? Like right now, you got the Wondolowski, you got the Zussi, you, you, you know, but, but we've even seen in free agency, you have a guy like Robles that goes down to Miami for one year. Gaddis is another here. Uh, and, and we just had Beckerman and, and Ramondo, right? Like I think that is starting to age out. And so for Raymond Gaddis, I, I think uh, he's going out on top in you know big way, for Philadelphia, right? Like they've been improving year on year on year on year, and they finally got got supporter shield. They finally got the trophy. Uh, they had to face a lot of adversity through a challenging COVID year. Uh, so, so I think this is Ray Gaddis's way of going out on top, uh, and uh, I, I think it's fantastic. And uh, yeah, one, wonderful career for him. And he did all of this after nine long seasons was able to be a starting piece on a team that, you know, the union were able to raise their first trophy in club history last year, raising the 2020 supporter shield. Um, and just randomly thought this right now, is there any player that you feel right now in major league soccer could have a Ray Gaddick, Ray Gaddis esque uh, career that spends about a decade at the club and, you know, just is like, kind of that faithful player for the club over such a long tenure like is there anyone right now that you that you can think of Vaughn you're nodding your head yeah I I think the name that just popped in my head is a Tristan Blackman sort of guy um where where he started there and and I don't know that he's you know going to have that like next I, I don't see him going to Europe uh but I could see him being a guy that uh starts from the beginning of a franchise becomes a quick starter uh, and, and rides the career out. Yeah, absolutely. That's the kind of guy that, that I could see going that route. Tristan Blackman, definitely. I think that's a that's a very good shout. Um, I, for some reason, I was thinking of a guy like like Brian White. For some reason, for like the Red Bulls, like I don't think. And, and no, this isn't to, to to shit on Brian White. I just don't think like you know his next step is going to be a level of Europe. Um, and he's a very good MLS player. He's still young. I think he can be scoring goals for the Red Bulls for the next, you know, eight, nine years, whatever it may be. Um, so I don't know. That was just a random thought I had, Jason, Sam. I don't know if you guys have anyone, but if you do, toss it out for sure. This might not be like along the same like lines that you guys are looking at, but like Valeri has been what eight seasons with Portland, and I honestly don't see him like leaving. Or, I don't know. I, I just don't feel like if he's going to leave, he's not going to go to another MLS team, in my opinion. If at all. I guess the only difference with Valeri, it's like he's played at another club in his career, you know? But Fair. I see what you're saying, like MLS-wise. <laughs> in MLS, since 2013, he's been with Portland, and he's been pretty damn consistent. Yeah, 233 I mean, yes. games played, 220 started. You're you're 100% right with that, so so I'll agree with that. Sam, nobody on the spot. I mean, the only guy I can think of, like, and it's not a great take anymore, but uh, a couple of months ago I would have said Jordan Morris for some reason. I just – I never saw him going to Europe. Mm. Like, he was very, very good, but he loves Seattle. He loves being there, loves being a homegrown. Yeah, that's where his dog is. He was so comfortable there. Oh, yeah, exactly. And But now he's gone. But, again, now he's injured. So he played, what, one game and – Swansea two games and now he's injured again for the year so I don't know he's played five seasons yeah. with um, that one ACL year so I don't know maybe a guy like him would be the guy I, I could imagine would do it but I think Europe's calling too much for him now 
No, that's that's completely fair. Um, okay, cool. No, just I guess I just randomly popped up um, on on the brain, so I want to see if you guys. Have I any, have one uh, more that, on that I have one yeah. more that didn't pan out. Like he's been on many teams since, but if you would have told me that Dax McCarty would have like just been on this many teams at this point, I would I would be kind of surprised five years ago. Yeah. Dax McCarty is the Nate Robinson of M- of MLS. Like the dude just played yeah. on like thirteen different clubs, and he's just been good wherever, wherever he's gone. It's, yeah, it's, it's insane. And you don't even like realize um, like how many. Clubs well, it's he's weird because it's like, why does he keep leaving? Like a lot of these, he's still good. <laughs> yeah. No, you're you're not wrong at all. I don't know. It's uh, it's whatever. I, I clubs Let's get is the major soccer. they rust. <laughs> yeah. It? Come on, you guys don't have that poll. Jeez. Come on, Dax. All right. <laughs> I mean, look, Dax is a very nice guy. I have seen him score um, a game winner before at Red Bull Arena. That was cool. So I, I would be all for, for talking to Dax and telling him that moment that he probably and maybe actually might remember a game winner. But whatever. Let's move on. Let's move forward. Um, one thing that's not on the notes that I want to talk to you guys about real quick. He's going off book, guys. Sometimes I, I go I go through periods, and this is a little insight into my brain to you guys and to the listeners. I go through periods right, where I need to catch up on my podcast. I go for like a break of like I just can't listen to, to people for for like let's say it's like a week, right? And then so I that the all the podcasts I missed that last week, I need to catch up on. And I'm I'm insane, but it's just what I do. I was listening to Extra Time, and Extra Time used one of my tweets, and I, I caught it like what three, four days later. I felt like a dick because it's like, hmm, they finally, you know, they saw something, they used it. I didn't acknowledge it day of or day after, whatever. But pretty much, I put out a tweet out there that said, heading into 2021, there are 14 Major League Soccer clubs who have not won an MLS Cup. I'm not going to ask you guys to name the 14 clubs, but just Montreal. off the top of your head, do you, do you, <laughs> do you think that, I know Montreal is one of them? Do you think that there is Inter one Miami. of those 14 teams that have the best shot of winning MLS Cup? Is Enter oh, Miami your actual that. no? Your actual pick? No. Okay. I'm trying to think of who hasn't won a cup that could do it. So while you guys think, I'll read through the 14 teams who have not won an MLS Cup. Obviously, it's Austin FC. Haven't played a game, so what? can't win a cup. Oh, um, FC, I can see it. FC Cincinnati again, shocking. I know. Um, yeah. FC Over Dallas, right LAFC, Inter Miami, uh, Minnesota, Club de Foot Montreal, uh, Nashville, New England Revolution, NYCFC, the Red Bulls, Orlando City, the Philadelphia Union, and the Vancouver Whitecaps. I guess of those fourteen teams, man, some of those are kind of embarrassing. Think? Not gonna lie. <laughs> You mentioned right, like right, a bunch but... of teams that were like just like four years into the league and then like oh, and then Red Bulls. <laughs> there's there's two teams there that have been there from the beginning, you know, but it's <laughs> yeah. Uh Vaughn, yeah. Yeah, I got I got two teams that to me are super obvious for like could could win it this year. That's LAFC and to me New England. I have New England really, really high on my list. Um <sighs> I, I know you guys are responding. Guy. That's my guy. Yes. Hey, I, New, I need to stand up for this one. You, you got to look like at New it. England, though. I, hey, I'll, <laughs> yes. I'll, I'll, I'll freely speak about New England leading yes. up to this season. I tried this to season. ride with them in the playoffs, and they made me sad. But, you know, <laughs> but, but, but hey, they, they were a team that made the, the <laughs> conference finals, right? They really were pretty close to making it to MLS Cup. Yeah. Uh, and, and this is a team that we did not see their full squad healthy really until the postseason. Right, like like the attack of uh, Carlos Hill, Gustavo Bo, and Adam Buxaw, it's hard to top in this league. Uh, and they have a really strong defensive core, and they have a head coach that has experience winning MLS Cup in this league. So for me, New England has all the pieces that are there. They have a roster that's not turning over. They've strengthened with guys like Christian Mafla. So this is a team that is going to be entering the season with a lot of talent and a lot of potential for a really deep run. They don't have to improve much to make it to MLS Cup. And I think that they do have an opportunity there. So for me, from that list of the teams that could go that next step, LAFC and New England are my one and two. Okay. I understand okay. LAFC. That makes sense. I feel New like England, we need not to say LAFC. I mean, yeah. So I think all four of us can agree LAFC definitely one yeah. of the, the top teams that I just read off. 
I don't hate your New England pick. I just don't know if there's like I think I can name like five, six teams over them that that I think could win MLS Cup more likely in my opinion. But I get it, Vaughn. I respect. I respect the the opinion there. Harsh. Jason or Sam, do you guys want to? First of all, if you guys want to react to the New England pick, go for it. But you guys have any other team that I named? Uh, I do. Jason, would you like to go first? Or no, you uh, go ahead. You go ahead. All right. So I, I actually i i like the i like the New England pick. I think I think Vaughn's right. I think that that's a team with a head coach that knows what they're what he's doing. He's won MLS Cup how many times? Two, three, five. I think like four or five. <laughs> Yeah, a lot, a lot of times. Like, that guy knows what he's doing, and he's finally got a roster building up in New England that's pretty scary. You know, and they look good last year, and I think just getting better and better. However, I will not say New England is mine. And this year, obviously, besides LAFC, and, like, I don't think Red Bulls are going to be very good this year, but um, I think Minnesota is gearing up for, like, a run. And that's – I'm convinced of Minnesota this year. I really like what they did. You know, Ike Parr will be back healthy this year. They've got um, maybe, maybe that's that's uh, still a whatever. Maybe but he's gonna be back healthy. I don't even care because I'm going back <laughs> through the roster. They got Will Trapp this off season. Dane St. Clair is easily the number one starter in goal. Tyler Miller does not stand a chance to take back number one. Um, and they've just been picking up guys. Ethan Finley's like destined for greatness. Asani Dotson's gonna look good this year. I'm sure of it. Like these guys uh, and Ozzy Alonso holding down a midfield with someone like um, Will Trapp. And then a guy like Ja'Cory Hayes, maybe, or, or maybe someone a little farther forward at like the 10 spot. That's a good team. And even losing Kevin Molino to um to Columbus, like I, I'm pretty confident in this Minnesota team for this year. So Minnesota was my other team outside of LAFC that I was gonna say. Um sorry, Tom. <laughs> I have a I have a slight, slight lean towards towards Dallas. I'm always mm-hmm pushing for Dallas. I don't know. That's just me. I feel like they play a nice style of soccer. I feel, I feel like if you can get a healthy Paxton Pomichol for a full season, which he wasn't healthy last year, he's an absolute game changer on his own too. So I feel like you could argue Dallas. I'm not saying it's my strongest take. I think LAFC and Minnesota are better takes, but I think Dallas should be talked about. Um, Jason, sir, if you have anyone. It's okay if you don't. We named He's five looking sneaky I mean, the, over two, there. the two teams would have been Minnesota and Dallas that I probably would have named. Um, I can't really make a case for. I mean, maybe the Union. Okay. Union. I mean, yeah. but they like they lost some pretty. Pivotal lost a lot of people. people. Yeah, yeah, um, they got weaker, but they're still good. I mean, they're still a quality team, and uh, I mean, I think I guess the Union out of teams we haven't mentioned. Um, there's actually three teams that have never. One that were there in 1996. Sad. Oh, Revs, Red Bulls, and Dallas. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Dallas, Dallas Burn. Um, if you guys want to get more specific, I can because I got more specific on the tweet. Of those 14 teams, there's seven teams that have never won a trophy. Obviously, Austin and FC Cincinnati. I'm not going to. You know, speak to that. Nashville, adding to that too. Ball. Obviously, Wait, they, they, they won the wooden spoon. Come on, Ooh. <laughs> oh. Oh, they got two man. of them hanging. They got two hanging. Bonds <laughs> might got some of those in Chicago as well. <laughs> I love this. So, so Austin, Cincinnati, and Nashville go with that. Explaining that those are up Fair. there. Well, um, Minnesota, Inter Miami too. So I guess Inter Miami four. Um, but yeah, Minnesota, New York City FC, and Orlando City have all not won trophies. So I guess if you guys want to get more specific, open yeah, it up to just twenty fifteen. A rough year for new teams. Yeah, right. <laughs> Orlando City was pretty darn close last year. Yeah. So opening up to more than just MLS Cups, out of these seven teams, do you guys feel like any of these teams could win a trophy? Does DK Do come back? Oh, Vaughn is nodding yes. Vaughn. Yeah, Orlando is by far the closest. Mm. I, I, I don't know what I wanted you to say. No, there's no Get question. Get out of here, New there's York no City. <laughs> no, it, there are way too many questions about New York City. Uh, but for Orlando, um, they took some real major strides forward. Uh, Oscar Pereja is doing this for the third time in the league of turning a, a roster around. Um, and they're adding to, to their already strength. DK uh, 
I, I, my gut tells me he's going to end up back in Orlando. I, I, there's no way he's going for twenty million. That's not happening. Um, Can I quickly no. say I agree? I think he ends up back physically in Orlando. I don't think he's physically ends up on the field for Orlando. We had a good conversation about this. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, we did. I, I think he does. I, I think, but I don't know that he makes it through the season. But I, I think he does make it onto the field for Orlando. Um, Got you. But, but I think that they have enough offensive weapons. Uh, I, I think the addition of Pato uh, could be really interesting there. Um, and, yeah, I, I, they, they are a team that has wow. not gotten weaker. They're, if anything, they're going to take that next step forward. Um, so I think they can build upon what they did last year. I am picking – no, I'm not picking New York City FC. We definitely you, got – You should. Even our, our, <laughs> our head coach is coming out here saying we have, like, no talent on the roster. So, you know, that's good. Um, Yikes. Jason, Sam, you guys have anything you guys want to finish up with before we get not to – Orlando. Some Bond's correct. <laughs> definitely yeah. Orlando. Well, well said. Okay. Well stated. Okay. Okay. Oh, wait, so should, Boom, doesn't that mean on. we all should have picked Orlando last time too? Like, no, no, no. Orlando we hasn't won MLS Cup. Oh. <laughs> to get, no, so they're going to win like, MLS Cup. Okay. No, they're going to so, win. They, like, they could so, win. But like, we all just like we just agreed Minnesota <laughs> is close to MLS Cup, but I guess I should have picked them to win a trophy. I, I do. You know, I don't think Minnesota. <laughs> get out of here, Long. I liked you five either? minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, Sam, I will say I think Minnesota's a a better pick for a trophy or for MLS Cup over Orlando City. I will agree with you there. But oh no no no! I, I honestly no, I think Orlando City's definitely up there. I was just like sitting there going, "Why didn't I pick Orlando City last time?" Like I was that, sorry, that was out loud. I wasn't disparaging a pick, but <laughs> you give me a hot Reynoso. We saw Reynoso leading uh, Minnesota by himself. So yeah. that's all Minnesota, that's what he Minnesota has no striker. They lost their second best player. We baby. What do you want? Oh, come on. Oh, no. yes. 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 They have no striker. They, they yeah, lost their Maria second best player. And there's no guarantee that Icopara is back in this lineup yet. So I am not giving that to Minnesota yet. Whatever. I can't, I can't whatever. wait for season six again. This is going to be good. No, we have a lot nice. to get if through. You guys, leave, if you so... forget about the fire again, Sam. Oh, oh yeah, I forgot about the fire and picked the Revs to make the playoffs. Oh, and then I was right. right. <laughs> That's why it's bad. It's so much worse. You accidentally I'm, I'm... got it right. <laughs> I'm moving this one forward, guys. We have a lot to get okay. through still. And Jason, we're, we're going to be relying on you for this next one, so get ready. Um, we have the 2021 plan for the NWSL has come out, which I'm excited about. I'm pumped about. There's a lot of cool news on and off the field here, so I'm going to get through some of it. The NWSL Challenge Cup is back for 2021 starting April 9th, so we're not too far away. We're less than a month away from the start of the Challenge Cup. 21 games in total. Um, the 10 teams within NWSL is going to be split into two conferences. Each team is going to play four games at home, and then the top two teams of the East, and then, well, the top team of the East, top team of the West, they're going to meet for a Challenge Cup final that will be played. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't say where the Challenge Cup final will be played yet, but the cool thing is that the Challenge Cup final will be streamed, uh, will be playing live on CBS, so big CBS, and also streaming on Paramount Plus, which I don't think is a active streaming service yet, but it's coming out within like the next few well, days or so like, or something like that. CBS All Access, it's the same thing. Like, it's Paramount Plus? Okay, it's cool. Switched, it just switched to, they're just renamed All Access. Got it. Cool. Okay. So CBS, Paramount Plus, which was formerly CBS All Access, all that fun stuff. Jason, I'm going to you first. The Challenge Cup, before we get to what's gonna what what after the Challenge Cup is gonna like. When you saw the Challenge Cup was back, what did you think? What did you like? And uh, kind of what are you feeling for this entire tournament? I mean, obviously I'm excited. Like it was is great to finally get some actual news about games and all that um, coming from that NWSL. Personally, I kind of liked the tournament bracket style that they did last year over just like a group stage with like the top two in the groups going moving on and in, in the championship but uh i mean i think it'll still be really enjoyable there's a lot of games none of the games like overlap either so theoretically you could watch every single game live if you wanted to 
um, which I think is great for, you know, scheduling purposes um, <clears throat> because, you know, some people will do that. Maybe I will, um, <laughs> depending, depending on when they are. Um, but they, they also have like some two, two COVID rules. Basically, like you have to play two games to even be considered to be in the, the final. And then the other rule is that um, if the game is like postponed or canceled, due to like another team's negligence about like COVID, like one of them gets it and, and they deem it as like a, that was your fault. Like that, that team forfeits and the other team gets the win. So it's not just like tie or nothing. Like that team will just forfeit their game, uh, which I found pretty interesting. I mean, obviously there were some issues last year prior to the tournament, <laughs> um, but I mean, overall it's super exciting. Like, I couldn't be happier. I think there's a, lot of competitive teams i think there's probably one team that i would say is the favorite but the i could see probably three or four teams challenging for this five so that, that's kind of where i wanted to ask i just did obviously a quick look of the roster so far obviously you know clubs still have another month or so to really finalize any moves before you know nwsl soccer is officially back on the field but I, in my quick look, I think there's seven teams that are pretty strong coming out of the gate. Um, I don't know. Maybe I'm overestimating some clubs, but I, I, I think that the West is pretty strong if, if you're looking at the uh, bracket. So in the Eastern Conference, you have Racing Louisville, Sky Blue, Orlando Pride, Washington Spirit, and the North Carolina Courage. And then in the West, you have uh, NWSL KC. Um, Olympic Leon Reign, Chicago Red Stars, Houston Dash, and the Portland Thorns. So I think the West is, is stronger than the Eastern Conference, in my opinion. But still, you have talent on both sides uh, of these conferences. Uh, Vaughn, Sam, did you guys have anything kind of when you were initially seeing the announcement that you wanted to, to touch on before we get to what the regular season is going to look like? No? Not really. All good. Nope. After the 2021 Challenge Cup is over, NWSL will be playing a regular season. This will be a 24-game regular season where six of these teams will be making the NWSL playoffs in 2021. So, what, 60% of the league is making the playoffs. I always hate that. I preferably like playoffs being a little bit less lenient into letting teams in, but whatever. Um it's going to be a real fun year. I'm, I'm excited that NWSL kind of – I feel like they gained a lot of traction in 2020 with – the Challenge Cup being the first sporting event back in yeah. professional sports, or second, maybe the PGA was first, but NWSL was either, what, first or second within allowing professional sports back in 2020. Um, and I think they gained a lot of viewers, a lot of fans, and I'm excited to, to have more come, and I'm definitely going to be checking out all these games when I can. I always have my two screens up, and <laughs> my, my one over here. There's a lot oh, of competition cool. this year as well. Yeah, where like like you said, there's maybe seven teams. Uh, I'd probably say not seven, <laughs> but but there's probably I'm lenient. Okay, I could probably pick five <laughs> teams that will at least be in the conversation, or would not be surprised at all to to be in the top spot. <laughs> I think I can pick out my two teams that you would disagree with, but it's fine. We are going to do some full <laughs> NWSL previews uh, when we get closer to the season. We'll break down rosters. We'll say who we like. We'll preview the Challenge Cup. And then also, you know, heading into the regular season, we'll do all that too. So uh, we'll do more in-depth stuff, you know, closer to a yeah. month from now. But um, that's pretty much where we're at with the NWSL. I am going to be quickly running through this next session section because uh, I don't feel like you guys have much takes on it. So USL Championship, my boys in the second division, they also released their plan for what 2021 is going to look like for them. So um, similar to NWSL, USL Championship said that they are going to be splitting into two conferences, but underneath each conference, you're going to have two divisions. So two conferences, four divisions, that's math right there. You got the Eastern Conference, you got uh, the Atlantic Division, and you have the Central Division. And then the Western Conference, you have the Mountain Division and you have the Pacific Division. Just quickly off my brain, and again, I'll probably do something um, maybe on just a video by myself, like previewing some uh, USL stuff. But I think the Eastern Conference, I really like the Eastern Conference uh, Atlantic Division. 
I think that's going to be super tough. And then obviously the Western Conference Pacific Division with Orange County, with Phoenix, with San Diego, I think that's going to be super tough. So we'll kind of see how playoff spots um, come from these divisions. We're not really sure yet what what that's going to look like, but this is just kind of the layout for USL. I'm excited. Um, I think that there's going to be a lot of fun soccer played in our second division. So if you guys don't follow USL, uh, follow it, watch it. It's definitely some just added soccer in your life. So got to pick a new quick team little... this year. <laughs> yeah, you got you got to find a team first. Yeah, and then, and then sad, we'll, we'll sad see. train noises. <laughs> choo choo. Um, oh. <laughs> poor El Paso. Let's talk. Let's talk. I really want about... to Sam. It's not them. <laughs> the announcement today should have worked on Jason Christ. Uh, Jason Christ, if you guys don't know, is our uh, U20 uh, uh, head coach. Solid so name. he great name, right? <laughs> Thank you, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> he announced the 20 uh, man Olympic qualifying roster, and I'm seeing a lot of uh, torn opinions on Twitter on the on the Twitter machine uh, about this roster. I'll quickly read through the rosters, and then Vaughn, I'm going to go to you first on my question, so I'm just preparing you before I read. Uh, three goalkeepers in uh, JT Marcinkowski, David Ochoa, and Matt Fries. Then you have Sam Vines, Aaron Herrera, Julian Araujo, and Hassani Dotson, all who can play somewhat of a fullback position. Within the uh, center backs, you have Henry Kessler, Mauricio Pineda, and Justin Gled. Within the midfield, Jackson Newell, uh, Yoni Cardoso, uh, Hassani Dotson, Andres Correa, um, and then Georgi Mihailovic. Very, very limited choices within the midfield there, in my opinion. On the wings, you got Jonathan Lewis, Sebastian Saucedo. Uh, Mihailovic can play on the wing as well. Uni Linez and Benji Michelle. And then I guess uh, at the striker position more specifically, you got Jesus Ferrara, Sebastian Soto, and then Benji Michelle can also play that nine. So Vaughn, I'm going to go to you. When this first dropped today, I guess – what were your takes on on the roster on a potential starting eleven that could come out of these twenty guys? Uh, I think that we're really thin at center back, and I think yeah. we're yes thin in the midfield. Uh, it's going to be really telling exactly how Jesus Ferreira is utilized. Uh, I think they've been pretty pretty clear that uh, at the national team level they're trying to use him as a false nine. That that's kind of his uh, strongest spot. So where he's listed as a striker, I don't know that he's really going to be the true striker. I think our best formation would probably have Soto out there and have Ferreira playing underneath him. So maybe that's why they went a little bit thin in the midfield, is thinking the same sort of thing. Um, I don't think there were a lot of like bad calls here, right? I, I think that the team can be competitive. Um, I, I don't think that there's a, you know, like a glaring, hey, we missed a guy for this roster. Um I, I think that heading into Olympic qualifying, this is a team that uh, can make it happen. Obviously, I do want to say before Sam and Jason, I get to you guys, there's a lot of big names missing, right? There's a lot of big names who qualify for this roster who aren't there. A Brian Reynolds who just went to Roma. A, uh, uh, you know, all the youngsters we have with Tyler Adams, with um, – Weston McKenney with those guys, like they're obviously not going to be released for a youth national team event like like this qualifying. Um, the only big name that I really saw that people had some complaints about not being there was Jeremy Obobese. Um, obviously, there's other names like a like a Tanner Tessman who wasn't there, or like an Eric Williamson who wasn't there. Um, for some reason, this is the little um, Timbers limited on the roster. Don't know why. And then obviously Dallas would have had Stupid. like five players taken off their roster. So they, they allowed uh, Ferrara to go. And I think that's it from Dallas. But um, Sam, I'll go to you next. Kind of what did you think of when you saw this roster? Yeah, the roster, like Vaughn said, it, it's weak at center back and it's weak at central midfield, which is surprising for a guy like uh, Jason Christ who likes to play 4-3-3. And traditionally, if I remember Jason Christ, it's one holding midfielder. But it's been yeah. when was the last time Jason Christ coached? Like three years, two years ago. So uh, from what I remember, coached. somewhere. He coached. Yeah. yeah so sure. anyway, Jason Christ four three three. That's his thing, which is, it, it's great for our our attacking players because you'll see guys like Jonathan Lewis and Uli Linez. I'm sure we'll see Sebastian Soto a lot. 
um, which is great, but it, it does worry me at the back. You know, um, Herrera, Rajo, Sam Vines, they're really good players. But are they going to be able to hold up against, you know, these um, quick, quick players that Mexico and Costa Rica have? Because our group in, in Olympic qualifying is Mexico, Costa Rica, and the Dominican Republic. And we could easily come Costa third. Rica's, Costa Rica's roster is very good. Yeah, we could, we could easily come third in this group, and it wouldn't even surprise mm-hmm. some people. There, we're up against a lot of competition, and it's it's going to be tough with, with this roster. But guys, like, having Johnny Cardoso is going to be really nice. That's a guy who was very close to winning uh, a trophy uh, with Internacional in Brazil this year, and you know, he, he was playing a lot, and he scored, scored a goal. Like, and I, so I think having that kind of experience will be nice. And then, obviously, the guys up front, but who, who are we going to pair in the midfield? Like, Mihailovic maybe can play central, but really, like, what are we going to see? I, so I don't know. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm concerned. I'm very concerned about what we're going to have. Jason, I'll go to you before, before I, I touch on that. Yeah, so I'm kind of, like, I don't want to just, like, echo what you guys have said, but, like, the center back thing is weird to me. Like, why also, do Justin we have- Glad is, like, only 22 still? <laughs> it's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. <laughs> Why do we have four defensive mids and only three center backs? Like this seems at, like a little off to me. Like obviously, I'm happy uh, Pineda's in there. Uh, some Chicago Fire love. Um, but at the same time, it's like like you guys have been saying. Like the 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 midfield depth is a little weak. But there's four defensive mids, and that just seems like an absurd number to have. Um, where I think like an Eric Williamson would have been the perfect person to be in this, like in this midfield, a, I think he's earned it. He's been awesome. And B like, we don't need four defensive mids. I don't know how many times I got to say it, but it's just like a shitload. Um, but other than that, like I'm excited. It looks like a good going off that Jason. I feel like of the, what is it? One, two, three, four, five midfielders if you want to uh, consider Mahalovic a midfielder still because he's been playing a lot on the wing but if you consider those five midfielders four of them are what people would consider true natural d mids like that's not like good i don't know it's just it's very confusing i saw a statement from christ today saying that a lot of these guys on this roster are versatile and can play many positions True. Jesus Ferrara can play many positions. Hassani Dotson can play many positions. Um, you know, uh, wow, Herrera. Can't think of, of Herrera's first name on RSL, but can play right back, can play left back. He's even touched the wing. He's touched center back where it's needed, right? So a lot of these guys can be very versatile, but you're missing out, I, in my opinion, you're missing out on guys playing their natural position where they exceed well, like Tanner Tessman, like Eric Williamson, like Jeremy Obobese, you know, guys who should have been released for this roster. I don't know if they were or not, and who just weren't. And, you know, that that's they're just not here. And then that's the confusing part to me. And if also you're gonna call in four D mids, bring in James Sands who can play center back too. <laughs> that's, that's my take on this. Yeah, to bring it, it up. <laughs> but 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 that's that that's I my, mean versatility is good. But it also can be negative. Like it also can yes. be a bad thing. And I think, yeah. sure, if you have a, a a couple versatile players who are really good and excel in certain positions that you really are are weak in, like I get it. Bring bring some of those guys in because you can slot them in where you need it, mid game, end of game, as a sub, even at as at the start. But like that's where those are really important. But you don't need a bunch of players who can play multiple positions when in reality, like you want these guys, especially with the national team to be comfortable in a certain role. They're getting less practice together because just it's the national team. They're not playing on like a club team together year round Um, in, in these positions need to be more solid where, you know, a couple of versatile players who might be spotted in is good, but too many is I think could work against us. Is there anyone outside of, like, you know, we named Williamson. Um, I know Jeremy Abobasi, like I said, his name was thrown around. Is there anyone that you feel like who should have been released for this roster was a big miss, not called in by Christ? 
I'm trying to pull up the roster again now, just to like the they had that big uh, like forty yeah. something, and I just I can't find it anywhere. I was a little, I guess, confused on Conrad De La Fuente. I'm a big Conrad De La Fuente fan. It's not like he's been making Barcelona first team 18s. Mm-hmm. He's been playing a lot with Barcelona B. Um, that was one that I really would have liked to see uh, released for for this camp and seen him get some more experience within the national team uh, or a national team setting in big game competitions. But that was really kind of just one that stood out to me. Um, again, James Sands was another one that stood out to me. But there's a few guys who I feel like confused why they weren't released. And if they weren't released, then obviously there's nothing Jason Christ can do about that. But would have liked to see a little bit more, uh, I guess, just different kind of players on, on this what about roster. Like, uh, of... What would you feel about, like, Owen Otisawi? Like, because he's not I playing all the it. time, but, like, it seems like a guy who should be able to be released. Like, it's not like he's starting every week for Wolves, so. I'm a big Otisawi yeah. fan. I would love to there, see I, it, but I we don't got, I got need the last. 17 more demon mids. <laughs> oh no! No, you don't want more D myth. Yeah, so I finally got the list. Uh, thank you, StarsAndStripesFD.com. I mean, so like just in the midfield alone, uh, Brendan Aronson was not going to get released. Efren Alvarez, that was also unlikely. Frankie Amaya, Cole Bassett, John Luca Busio, Caden Clark, uh, Cardoso got picked. Tasami Dodson got picked. Uh, Brooks Lennon, Jordy Mihailovic was in but there. Uh, Ke- Keaton right Clark. There, like, you named. You named a Bassett, lot of holding Clark, Busio. I would have liked to see Busio. Three, I, Busio three guys who I don't know where Busio is playing. <laughs> see, point. don't no, don't get me started on Jelanko oh. Busio. Yeah, well, like, it's just, I'm already talking. It's shit weird. But, and then, like, even even at center back, like the really only other options we could have had were um, we could have gotten Austin Trusty, um, Miles Robinson, who Atlanta was never going to let go. Uh, Bubakar who yeah. Columbus was not going to let go. So, like, really, we're, we're just kind of at a loss at depth at center back and midfield at this age group Trusty of guys who we could actually that, see come out. I would have liked to see Trusty left. I don't understand why Trusty always, didn't get in. Always nice to have. Sam Vines did. Oh, I know why Sam Vines got in, but like, but Trusty, like, so why didn't they call in Trusty? Because Col- Colorado would have let him go. Maybe a lot of MLS clubs were only willing to release one player. Well, they also you know? got uh, Jonathan Lewis out of Colorado, too. So maybe um, they true. Colorado's trash. Yeah, this maybe they were like... Austin Trusty for Preston. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. No, I mean, the, the, as a whole, this this like preliminary roster, it kind of hurts to look at. Just a lot of guys who are never going to get released from their clubs. And that, unfortunately, that's where the talent's coming from. The talent's in Orlando. The talent's in Dallas. The talent's apparently in Colorado, but um, it's it's just yeah. I guess it's cool to see the names that we do have at such a young level. If you took mm-hmm. the entire player pool, right? If you took the 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 Tyler Adams all the way down to to the Hassani Dotsons of the world. I'm not saying Hassani Dotsons bad. I'm just saying that's the range you have, right? But it's like if we had our full eleven that could play in this game, we would we, we would be perfectly fine. We, we have guys playing at high levels way past Olympic qualifying, right? So it sucks, but at the end of the day, this is this is the, the cards we're dealt, and I have faith in this 11. I have faith in a lot of, uh, of these players who are going to potentially be starting for us. I like Sam Vines. I like Julian Araujo. I like Sebastian Soto. Let's just get it done. Let's hope that some players, maybe let's hope Ferrara, Vaughn, like you were saying, is playing more in the midfield and he can kind of be versatile and, and help us out there. But I don't know. There's, there's a lot going on that I'm not too excited about. I mean, we we've got a deeper pool, you know, like I think the good thing is that we have yeah. a deeper pool to pick from and you have a couple guys that you just men- mentioned that are getting full national team minutes, right? Like you got guys like Ferreira, you got guys like uh, Jackson Ewell, you, you got Sam Vines. These are guys that are getting starts for the full men's national team. Um, and so I think that having also that crossover, that maybe that's some of what else is happening here is that they're trying to get those guys that 
that can start building those relationships, building those connections on the field at the national team level and kind of bridging that gap as some of these guys that are that are at the Olympic level are going to mature into the full national team. So we, we could pick it apart, but, but ultimately at the end of the day, the goal is to, to qualify. So can this team get through that? That, that? That's all that matters right now, and I think this team can. They can. It's just going to be tough. Last point that I want to say about this, unless you guys have anything else you want to say, is I do like that pretty much I drew up a starting 11 out of this group because that's just where my brain immediately goes to. But um, everyone in my starting 11 was a starter for their team. From goalkeeper to striker, there was a starter within Major League Soccer or overseas. So I like that. I like that, you know, we have guys who are playing first team minutes and in good leagues. And, you know, that's that, that's where we are. So, Vaughn, like you said, this team can do well. This team can qualify for the Olympics. It's just going to be tough because Mexico, their, their uh, U23 roster is very good. Costa Rica, if you look at that roster, it's very good. Um, you know, so it, it'll be tough, but let's hope they can do it and let's hope we can get – uh, some U.S. youth soccer back into the Olympics. Yes. Cool. That's uh, March 18th, 6.30. And we will, be, uh, we will be definitely talking about those games on this podcast. So I have a video that I want to pull up. It's, it's a photo that I would really prefer to pull up, but it has to be a video. So if you're watching this, read super quickly. I'll just keep clicking and bring it up. But, guys, I am going to – Call on you one at a time. I'm going to go, Jason, Sam, Vaughn. You guys have to, as quickly as possible, tell me your striker that you are going to be picking for the U.S. men's national team. If we had one game to save the planet, the aliens are coming down, and they're like, we're playing soccer against the U.S. men's national team. You need to put out your best 11. And if you guys beat us, we'll go away. We beat you. We destroy the planet. You guys need to tell me who your striker is. So, Jason, as soon as this goes up, you got, like, Five seconds to tell me, brother. What? Oh, what the? <laughs> he just said go. Uh, Josh Sargent. Oh, okay. Sam, I'm going to keep on clicking this. So, Sam. Um, Yeah, Sargent's in form right now. I picked Josh Sargent. Um, Zardis. Zardis. Oh, I like it. I really like that. Um, I like this I maybe... Oh, my God. My hands it's are really fast. I'm trying to scan. Yeah, I know, I'm like, sorry. Are these I, I, it's also really small. We are going to be fixing this for next week. I'm just going to say that. But I may be going hot take here, um, but I want A.O. No, no. What? I want him. Give me him. You can, you can want him all you want. Is he going to score a goal when you need it? Pull it up again. Pull it up again. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Super fast video. I think I'd pick Soto over Akinola. Can Even Haji that? Wright is looking really good right now in Denmark. I'd pick DK. Daryl DK. I mean, look, act lump it long. The only the only other person when I was looking at this, obviously I was staring at this way longer than you guys because I have it on my phone. The only other person that I really would have picked I think is I uh, <laughs> Sibichu. The the striker for young boys that oh, recently yeah, came in, out. Right? Oh yeah. <laughs> that he that he wants to represent the US men's national team. I mean, He's just give me this all day. Just give me this. Just, this is all I want to see for the U.S. men's national team. All right. That was just something I wanted to try out with the video. We'll, we'll get it fixed, and I'll practice it for next week. So Maybe make it a bit guys, larger and a picture. You know what? I'm working on it, okay? I'm working on it. It's going to be like – it's going to be Tom, like, with little, like, writing on a picture. Did you see can this? You, can you see it? There it is. <laughs> all right. You guys have the notes in front of you, so you have seen all of the player moves within Major League Soccer that have happened in the past week and a half-ish. Um, since there is four of us, I'm going to say we all pick one, and we all pick one that we want to talk about and that we like. So I don't know if any of you guys have had a chance to look at this yet. It's cool if you haven't. I can go first. Jason, is that a yes that you've looked? Yes. Okay, Jason, you're taking it, bud. Go first. Uh, Give me a player I'm, that you like, or the player move you like. I'm liking this move, um, Marlon Harrison to Columbus. Because, yes. I mean, first of all, like, the last two seasons haven't been ideal. I mean, since his Colorado days, he hasn't been amazing. But they're not asking him to be amazing, right? They're Like, he's going to Columbus not to start every game 
not even to play every game probably. He just needs to be that guy who they can sub on or play in a game where a lot of they got a lot of tired legs because they're in all these competitions. And he's honestly like the perfect piece for that. And to get him as a free agent is just like what the, the rest of the league, like, come on. Like what the hell? No, so, look, I, yeah. I agree with you. Columbus's backup team could probably beat like some lower tier. DC like, United. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> what I was thinking. I was thinking more Cincinnati, but you know, He's trying to fight, whatever. But okay. Yeah. No, they could of, probably be. They could probably beat United. They could probably beat NYCFC. Thanks. Okay. Stop it. Uh, <laughs> Vaughn. He's trying. Yeah, I see your. your I see your brain churning over there. Give me a uh, a move that you like from this past week and a half. I'm trying to decide which of the ones I want to take because I think there's two really good ones. Um, we can go for a second round if we do this pretty quickly. That's true. Okay, okay. okay. I'll start then with <laughs> Bruno Gaspar. Um, yes. I, I like this move for Vancouver. I think it's definitely going to be an understated move, uh, but they're bringing uh, a guy with quite a good pedigree uh, in at right back. Uh, and I – I think we all have talked at some point about how much we love Ali Adnan. Uh, yeah. So uh, Bruno Gaspar being on the opposite side of the field. Uh, I, I just, I want Vancouver to start to turn things around for I, I big Mark Dos Santos fan. Uh, I, I think that they've had a lot of signings that have not landed, have not, have not done well. Um, and, and I would like for Vancouver to uh, get that bite back into their roster and uh, Bruno Gaspar, I, I think they have their outside backs locked down. Uh, I think this is going to be a good move and, and an everyday starter for them. Uh, yeah, Bruno Gaspar is the one I wanted to highlight. I like the move because my first thought immediately went to, oh, they have awesome outside backs now, Ali Adnan and now Bruno Gaspar. So that was immediately where my brain went to first, too. I like his background. He's played a lot in Liga Nos. He has some Serie A experience as well. He's won pretty much wherever he's gone with sporting, with Olympiacos. He's won, right? He's he's done well. He's played in Europa League qualifying games, and I think Europa League too. I just don't trust Mark Dos Santos' ability to scout overseas, bring these guys over, and then have them produce within Major League Soccer because they haven't. Ali Adnan's the only one that, that I can think of off the top of my head who's really hit for, for Marco Santos that he's brought over. Um, everyone else who's hit, hit Maxime Cropo all came from within Major League Soccer, you know? So it's like, I don't know if this is going to work. I hope it does. I hope this is the start of something for Vancouver to turn around because it's not too long ago that Vancouver was a top three team in the Western conference, which is incredible to say when you think about the Vancouver Whitecaps now in 2021, but I like it Vaughn. I'm with you there. Um, Sam, I'll go to you. Yeah. I'm going to actually talk about someone who left from the Whitecaps and that is uh, Freddie Montero going back to the Seattle Sounders. I mean, when, Freddie. when I started watching MLS, Freddie Montero was a sounder and I used to watch him banging goals and I thought he was incredible. And, Watched him leave. He went to um, Sporting in Portugal for a couple of years, played out there, came back. He won some cups, had some experience, went to uh, Vancouver, and now is back. And uh, I see this as a really good uh, – obviously, he's not going to be a starter uh, in front of Rui Diaz, but as a backup, a guy who has 200 MLS games, you know, 73 MLS goals, 35 MLS assists. Like he He knows the league. He knows how to play in it. He knows how to do well in the league. And I, I foresee this as – Seattle bringing back a fan favorite who can do the business when Rui Diaz needs a break. Seattle also bringing back their all-time leading goal scorer, too. Pretty cool. Um, I like it. They also have Will Bruin on the roster, which confused me why they're going, like, three <laughs> deep at striker. But Well, now you don't have Jordan Morris. They'll probably try to push someone to a wing. I'm wondering with this, with... The la they they have like no wings on the roster. Right? Like Christian Roldan is like a converted winger. If He's that, a center midfielder to man. that. Exactly, I agree. I'm wondering if Seattle is going to push to a four four two and play with two strikers up top. Maybe like Freddie Montero's the the super sub off the bench to a Ruby Diaz Bruin or Ruby Diaz Montero with Bruin coming off the bench. Whatever it may be, I think that's where they're going. So I like this striker depth. So 
I definitely like that move, Sam. I am going to turn to uh, our nation's capital, DC United, bringing in a, uh, a vet from uh, the Belgian uh, first division. Uh, and Brendan Hines Ike, Ike, Ike. I don't know how you say it. Brendan Hines Ike. I'm gonna He's go with that. He's from Denver. One. It's probably um, Ike. <laughs> so bringing in an American one is always. I like to see Americans come home to a dude who has a ton of experience over between the Alsben Ken and then the uh, the Jupiter Pro League, uh, which you know I'm just naming off random European leagues now, but. He has a ton of European experience. He's played very well. He has a ton of minutes and a ton of games over in Europe. DC needed a center back, right? With Burnbaum, not, I don't think he's going to come back this season. If he does, it's going to be way later on in 2021 yeah. because he had surgery. You know, uh, Lasada plays a three man back, or he played a three man back over in Europe as well, coming from the same league that Heinz Ike is coming from. So maybe that familiarity there. I think there's a lot of positive connections. I like Lasada bringing in a dude, an American dude from the league he was just at, he probably was super impressed with, bringing in a guy at a position that he needs three of, or other rosters need two of them. And He's still 26 years old, 27 years old. Like he's in his prime. He's playing well. I like the move a lot. I think he could arguably be their best center back in 2021. If, you know, Donovan Pines, very good. You have uh, Brendan Hines, Ike, and then you have Frederick Brilliant, like 37 years old. Not him, but it's fine. You know, whatever. You have to have one old guy playing in the middle of the three man back. So I like the move. I think it's definitely an upgraded center back, but uh, that's my pick. So, Jason, we've given you plenty of times. We'll go through a quick little uh, second round pick. Who's another movie you like really quickly? Um, oh, I, I was going to say none, <laughs> but <laughs> 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 I didn't really have any others. <laughs> it's okay if you don't. It's yeah, fine. I don't really have another. All right, Vaughn? Samuel Green. Yes. Yeah, big move for Galaxy. I think it's their biggest move of the offseason, clearly. Um, somebody who's going to be a starter for them. Uh, I think it's pretty clear that Christian Pavone is not going to be back for the Galaxy. Uh, yeah. So so this was uh, a, a guy that, once again, coming from one of the top five leagues, um, that is going to be able to step in there as a starter on the wing uh, into the attack, uh, hopefully be another piece that can provide some sort of service into uh, Chicharito. Uh, yeah, Samuel Granser was the big name on this list that I was hoping uh, nobody else brought up. So, one, I want to point out the Christian Pavone take because it's definitely something we should probably mention. Pavone is being brought up on alleged rape charges down in Argentina. So, Pavone probably off many, if all, soccer teams, um, you know, hot list to, to, to grab him. Um, so, with Pavone being gone, obviously the Galaxy need to look for new winger options. I'm going to assume that this deal has been in the works for a little bit, bringing uh, Grancier over from Monaco. The guy's played a ton in Ligue 1 and Ligue 2, um, and he's, he seems like a very good player. He's 24. He's French. That's always it's always fun to see, right? So I like the move a lot. Greg Vanny is, bringing, is quietly bringing together this Galaxy roster, and I have to give him a ton, a ton of credit. Um, Sam, I'll go to you for a uh, quick second pick. Yeah, I um I like Inter Miami grabbing Jovan Jones. I think it's a solid uh, piece at left back, left wing. Depending on where he goes, um his his time in, in Germany wasn't super exciting, super great the way it was when he played for Sounders. But I I think just him coming back is going to be, uh well, I, what is this? He, uh, he was back. Yeah, Sounders yeah. now, but. Without a club, enter Miami. There's a lot of quotes now, but I think I think Miami got themselves a good guy. I really like this. I can, I can agree with you. I think he's definitely an upgrade. Whether you're starting him, you know, on left back, right back, you're starting him. I like you're back. He's a backup technically at left wing, right wing, kind of wherever he's going to play on the outside. He's going to be an upgrade for Miami for where they were last year. So I definitely agree that I like that move a lot. Um, I'm torn between two players for my final pick. Um, it was either going to be me talking about the extreme Andrew Gutman saga that happened with 80 million moves happening to get him yeah. over to the States. Go follow Tom Bogert on Twitter if you want to see how the hell that broke down from how he went to Cincinnati, to Celtic, to Atlanta, 
to the Red Bulls. Vaughn, you want to say go for it? I was just saying we haven't even talked about Lucho Acosta. No, that's fine. Official. We don't. We don't have to talk about that. That's it's fine. not official yet. I'm, cool. I'm. I'm hesitant. It's, it's official. Cincinnati by Vettel. Atlas. <laughs> Is it? Um, oh yeah, duh. I forgot they announced it. Lucho Acosta. He's nah. going from Atlas to uh, Cincinnati. They have their ten. <sighs> Vaughn, you, you brought it up. I want to hear your takes. Um, I, I hope he can return to his uh, Lucha Roo form. Um, he, he's I was definitely to think of some type of Brenner Lucha Roo nickname, but I couldn't. I couldn't think of one. I uh, no Br- Br- Bruncho. I don't know <laughs> Bruncho. Yeah, that's it. Um, yeah, no, I. I think that it's definitely a step in the right direction for FC Cincinnati. I, I'm not sold that it pushes them over the top into like being a playoff team because they started so, so low. Um, <laughs> I, right. Like th- there's, there's a lot of work that's got to be done in that attack. I, I need to see it actually happen. Like on paper, I want to say that they look good, uh, but I got fooled last year by FC Cincinnati thinking the same thing. And then they get the wooden spoon um, it, it, it feels kind of like the Vancouver Whitecaps, I, I'm sorry, Chicago Fire, sort of like it looks good, it sounds good, it's exciting going into the season, but until they prove it, until it actually happens, I, I, I can't buy into it wholly yet. I'm with you on that. I think this pulls them out of wooden uh... – this pulls them out of being a clear front runner for food, Wooden Spoon. I'll, I'll choose my words carefully there. there. Um, but I mean, I like the move, right? You have a 10, you have a brand new fun striker. You've upgraded in other parts of the roster. Ronald Matarita being one that I'm thinking of clearly. Um, I think Cincinnati's definitely gotten better. You can say that they've improved. But Sam, do you want to talk about your former 10 or no? Yeah, what a, what a, my favorite players I've ever seen play live. He, Lucho Acosta is very, very good. And it was very clear that um, while at DC United, his first two years, the first year being on loan, and then when they signed him, that he was the best player on the field without a doubt. And um, his problem was that playing at that 10 and he and being that height that he is, he needed someone who could actually make runs forward. And he didn't have a guy to give service to until Wayne Rooney got there. And then uh, with Rooney, Ariola on the wing, like they started to really look like a good team. And then obviously Rooney left, Acosta left right after. And you can just kind of tell, like, you know, you're not going to see a guy like that again. But without a guy to make good runs, um, Lucho just kind of suffers. And so I think as long as Brenner is able to play the way his highlight tape shows him to play, I think those two together will be very, very good. Um, again, it doesn't solve their defense. So I don't know if the wooden spoon is out of the question, but um, I think up front, they're going to be more dangerous for sure. Plus, Jurgen Lacadia is still on the roster. Yep. And for everything we didn't see from him last year, he did score like one-sixth of the team's goals. So, you know, and he scored that one goal. Good thing, or is that I'm like just going to point, oh. point that oh. out. Oh. <laughs> so, if you have Brenner, you have Lucadia, you have Frankie Amaya, maybe, depending on kind of what the hell happens with him. You have a guy like Alan Cruz also in that midfield. Maybe things start to open up a little bit. Maybe you get more goals. Again, I'm not going to say they're out of wooden spoon contention, but they're out of being the front runner for wooden spoon. I will I will give Cincinnati that, and I will give uh, Yapstam that this offseason. The last move that I want to mention very quickly, Sebastian Berhalter going on loan from Columbus to Austin. Really like the move. Berhalter was never going to get minutes playing for Columbus, especially with Nagby, with Arthur, with Perry Kitchen, with Aiden Morris, with 80 other million guys you want to name in that midfield, right? He's a youngster. I think they're doing right by him. I think they're sending him to a spot where you know, his new head coach in Josh Wolf is friendly and was teammates and is friends with his dad in, uh, in Greg Berhalter. So there's obviously connections there. I think Austin's definitely going to take advantage of having some youngsters play a ton of minutes for them too. Um, I really like where they're going. I like what Austin's doing so far. I like bringing in Sebastian Berhalter. I think he's talented. I just don't think he's ever going to crack into the 18 at Columbus. So 
maybe it's a new home for him. I want to root him, root for him because kid's good. So that's where I'm at. Guys, any closing statements? Uh, you guys can shake your heads yes or no if you want. But any closing statements by the time uh, by by the time me finishing this up? I'm drunk. I'm just kidding. <laughs> this I'm not, sentence. I wish I was. Isn't Berhalter just on no. loan? Like, so he's going to have to yeah, go just back. The loan, it's a loan deal with an option to it, trade. And there was a lot of ta- or gam just to loan him, too, I thought. like I, I think there was, like, the money number. for a loan, right? It was. So, like, obviously, I, what I'm – Yeah, is at least Austin, like, wants him. Like, which is great. No, I, think and, like, I think they're definitely, definitely going to play him. They have to, right? Um, I mean, like, all, you, you go out for an interleague loan like this, you know, I think that he's definitely going to play. He's definitely going to be involved in the 18. They have a lot of guys who kind of rotate between being a six and an eight. And I think Burhalter is definitely more of an eight. If you gave me an opinion so far, I mean, he has like what four or five games to his professional career. So I haven't really seen much from him, but yeah. I think he could be a type of a, a box to box guy, whether you have him holding, I think he just adds some great youth, uh, young depth to this, to the squad. Well, and in terms of soccer philosophy, right? Like, Josh Wolf was an assistant under Greg Berhalter. So yeah. uh, you, you mentioned that their their friendship and, and playing together. Um, I, I think that also there's going to be that uh, same sort of uh, soccer philosophy that, that Sebastian's grown up with and been surrounded by. And he's going to be on the same page early on with Josh Wolf in, in those regards. So, um, yeah, I, I do hope he sees the field and gets some minutes. But that's my thought on Sebastian Berhalter. That's pretty fair, and I'm going to wrap things up with that. So, Jason, I know it was a quiet few minutes from you. I'm sorry, but you you, <laughs> no, you, you forfeited your second player, so yeah. you've been quiet. Sam, you're looking good in the man bun. Cheers. Producing Vonders, it was great to have you on officially for, for a first episode as producing and co-host. Guys, peace out. It was a great time listening. If you guys listen this far into the podcast, I appreciate you. I know these three guys appreciate you as well. If you listen this far, I don't know why you have at this point. I just ramble until I go, no, we okay, have great and then on the broadcast. Yeah, and we're that's smart. It. It's good taste. Funny. We're the dumbest podcast, but I love and it. Good I'm looking. So <laughs> All right, on that well, note, we are good baby. looking. Thanks, guys, for listening. <laughs> Peace out.